desire to know about the history that was missing. That was really the moment where it all started. And 30 years later, I'm still looking for what's not on the bookshelf, but really should be there. I am Despina Stratagakis, Vice Provost for Inclusive Excellence at the University at Buffalo, and also Professor of Architecture and a contributor to places. My interest in unknown histories or little known histories, the histories that don't appear on bookshelves and bookstores or libraries, but should be there, started with a radio show interview in 1990. I was in Montreal listening to the CBC radio and they were interviewing a former Bauhaus student, a graphic designer who had studied at the Bauhaus in Dessau. And he was asked about what the school was like. And he started to talk about all the parties that they had had and all of the women students. I had just finished a master's degree from Berkeley in design history. I had read about the Bauhaus. I had never heard about these women. And I remember thinking, what is he talking about? Who are these women? What are their stories? And so I went off to the library to read about it. And in 1990, there was very little written about women in the Bauhaus at that point. So what I confronted was sort of the absence on those shelves and the frustration of not being able to find out about this history that was clearly there and intrigued me. And I had no way to learn about it. That awareness of the absence on the bookshelves then led me to the archives eventually because I thought, well, fine, I'll write the books of that will then sit on the shelves. But the archives themselves then can be an impediment, a hurdle, if the material hasn't been collected. So when I began this journey of looking for the histories of pioneering women in architecture, finding the material at all was really challenging. And the archives were helpful and not helpful. Some definitely had material, many had not collected this history because they didn't think it was important. But going to the archives and asking for this material, even when they didn't have it, was very important. By asking for that material, you become a change agent because the archivists will now be aware that there is a history out there that is missing from the archive. One of the things I had to learn was actually to listen to the archive for what it wanted to tell me and to see the archive not as an obstacle, but to see the archive as a partner and in this larger quest and to be open for unexpected discoveries and where those might take you. I became interested in not just the histories that were not appearing on the bookshelves, but also interested in the ways in which power in architecture manifests itself in ways that you don't expect. I've looked at power and architecture and where they kind of intersect in many different ways. I've looked at those who have traditionally been disempowered by architecture and urban space, but I'm also interested in how power shows up at the other end of the spectrum for the most powerful people or institutions and where that can be also, where that can appear in unexpected places. So when I was looking at the history of women architects, I came across papers of Gail de Trost, who was Hitler's close artistic collaborator. She was a, a designer and worked with him on numerous projects, including the redesign of all three of Hitler's residences that he had had during the Third Reich, two unofficial, private, and one 
official. Looking at her involvement in Third Reich architecture led me to look at the role that his domestic spaces had played in the propaganda of the Third Reich. And to my surprise and horror, his domestic spaces and Gerdi Trost as creator of those spaces were used very effectively in Nazi propaganda to shift the image of Hitler, especially in the early to mid 1930s. In the late 1920s, his image was that of the radical firebrand. They realized his propaganda team that they could use his private life, which was invented for the public, and they used that as a lens to make him seem softer, nicer. They called him, you know, a good man. And they had his friends talk about what a good man he was in, in private. And then they used his domestic spaces as stage sets to enact that private man. What is horrifying is how effective this was. They used that very effectively right up until the start of the war. What interested me about Hitler's domestic spaces and how they were used was not just how powerful they were as a tool of propaganda, but also rethinking how we understand Third Reich architecture. Albert Speer was very good at promoting himself and promoting his architecture he really promoted his own work as the defining work of the Third Reich. That sort of approach that emphasized monumentality was not the only architecture going on in the Third Reich. And what I argued in Hitler at Home was that you have to understand that there were these other strategies in place to bring people into the fold. At the same time that you had the monumental architecture, which conveyed this message of submission and losing yourself in the crowd, you also had alongside that the domestic, the minute. This image of Hitler as both beyond and yet of the people was very seductive and very powerful. That made me wonder about what else was out there in terms of Third Reich architecture that we had missed. How can we either rethink the monumental or move to include other forms of architecture and understanding how Nazi ideology worked in that period through domestic, public and other kind of spaces. The project on Norway started yet again with a discovery in the archive that was not what I was expecting. I was looking at the papers of Albert Speer in the German Federal Archives in Berlin and came across this folder about a city that Hitler had commissioned in Norway, occupied Norway. So again, off I go to the library, again, absence. When I come across this form of, you know, missing chapters and missing books, I'm skeptical. I kind of wonder, like, really? Is there really nothing there? And of course, I knew that there was something there because I had just seen the file in the archive about an entire city that Albert Speer was designing. As I began to look into what had happened in occupied Norway from the point of view of architecture and planning, I discovered that, in fact, there was a very interesting history going on there. Norway became this canvas onto which Hitler and other Nazi leaders projected their fantasies about the world that was to come after they had won the war. The architectural sort of approach was shifting somewhat in this occupied territory and there was a greater attention than we might expect into creating spaces of everyday practice and life where the Norwegians could be helped to become part of this post-war Aryan world. Thinking about architecture and planning as ideological tools. Many of the projects were not built, but some were. There was a whole infrastructure that 
the Germans were building that was part of their vision of empire and to bring Norway into the fold of Nazi dominated Europe. But if we look to things like roads and railroads, I mean, those don't say Nazi structures the way that, let's say, Nuremberg the rally grounds do. So they built these really quite elaborate cultural centers for German soldiers. A lot of that was built, but again, because it's not monumental, it just hasn't been seen. So one of the things that I wanted to do with my book is just to start to raise awareness about the things that were left behind that were there at the end of the war. There were 23 Norwegian towns that were damaged in the invasion. Their reconstruction was overseen by Albert Speer, and this is where these new Nazi planning principles were brought in to influence how they were redesigned. And I was very surprised to discover that after the war, I mean, they had spent four or five years working on these plans. There wasn't time, there wasn't the resources. A lot of the groundwork had been laid to redo them. So these designs were actually built after the war, but that history for most Norwegians is forgotten. But there's also no question that the imprint of Nazi urban planning principles is there in what was built. Those spaces were created with a particular ideology in mind. So what does it mean now in terms of how they function in a democracy? And I'm, I find that a really interesting question that um, remains to kind of be explored. In wanting to intervene and to add to the bookshelf in terms of the histories that were missing. After a while, I realized that those interventions, they're extremely important. The Wikipedia edit-a-thons are another way to intervene. And these are exciting because everyone can do them. And this requires, you know, going to the library or now looking online, looking up proper historical sources and taking them off the shelf online encyclopedias, journals, and transforming those into Wikipedia entries. I was appalled at how few women in architecture were represented on Wikipedia. Not surprisingly, the largely male editors on Wikipedia did not think that women's history was often as important as that of men and would try to actually delete entries that were being uploaded about women in architecture, women in science, women writers, and others. The reason why it's important to think about sources like Wikipedia and other online sources is that this is what is shaping our sense of the world and our knowledge of history and what we think exists and doesn't exist. And so initially when I encountered that absence on the bookshelf, I wanted to intervene to make accessible to readers those stories, that history. But if that history disappears in the transition to the online world, then women architects disappear a second time. And it was my concern that the disappearance would happen all over again that led me to intervene in Wikipedia. Being curious about the stories that are not told, being confident that there are stories that are not being told and that those stories are not marginal. I think that's the most important thing. All of us have a part to play in filling up that shelf with all kinds of stories and worlds and histories that um, have not been written, but that are important about who we are and important to know. Those stories, those histories, they change how we see the world. I'm gonna keep pursuing them and see where they take me.